Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Seth Wiesman. I am a senior solutions architect at Verberica and a committer on Apache Flink. Uh, and I'm really thrilled to be giving this talk about how Flink in combination with Pulsar can provide a unified data processing plane for your organization. So if you are not familiar, Ververica is the company founded by the original creators of Flink. And along with supporting the open source community, we also offer some enterprise products to help bring stream processing into production. Uh, very excitingly, we recently released a community edition of our product, the Ververica platform, that simplifies all of your production operational needs when uh, running Flink applications. Uh, it is free to download, free to use in production, no arbitrary limitations on the number or scale of your deployments. I encourage you to take a look. So since this is a keynote, I thought I would start today by taking a step back and trying to discuss what this term stream processing really means. Uh, I suspect that if you're attending this conference today, you have some idea, but it can be a bit of a nebulous phrase. And I strongly suspect that if I took a poll of the audience, we would get a number of different answers. So I think most people, especially when they are new to this field, are going to describe streaming as real-time data processing or uh, real-time data-driven actions. And this definition makes a lot of intuitive sense. Most engineering teams are going to come to streaming because they received a product requirement for quote-unquote real-time reporting. Right? Your organization wants up-to-the-moment insights into how the business is performing to remain as agile in the market as possible. And so an engineer went off and did some research and said, aha, this is stream processing. And so they reach for a framework like Apache Flink to build up their solution. They do that, it gets deployed to production, everyone's happy. And now the engineering team says, we understand what streaming is, and if we need to build more real-time reports, then we're gonna go for streaming. So what this engineering team has done is taken the first step in understanding stream processing, and they see it to be a subcategory of data engineering. They view the world in these two spheres, one of slow changing data and one of fast changing data. So the world of slow changing data is where we perform ad hoc queries and do data exploration. This is where our data scientists and BI people live. They're gonna very quickly be making changes to their logic or queries. Uh, you know, iteratively submitting a query to a database, looking at the results saying, you know, that wasn't quite what I was looking for. Let me join with an extra bit of metadata or add an additional aggregation but eventually they settle on something that provides valuable insights and so at this point the query or business logic is not changing moment to moment but instead they want to run that logic continuously across new data as it becomes available in this worldview we have batch and streaming as two separate but complementary tools within our toolbox another way of coming to this definition is thinking about what stream we are practically processing, right? And the obvious answer here is that it's a stream of records that can be continuously processed in some ordered fashion. What's interesting about coming to the definition from this angle is that while we certainly want the capabilities of a system like Pulsar in practice to store and allow us to consume our stream, uh, the only real requirements I laid out for us were that we could read the stream continuously and orderly. And so less intuitively, but still readily possible, is to just treat the sequence of files as a stream. Right? This is a stream that's gonna be very chunky and spiky. Files only appear every hour, every day. Uh, it's very high latency. But as long as you read the files in order, rows, top to bottom, it's a stream. What's really interesting from this angle is that if we were to take a snapshot of this stream at a particular point in time, well then this is just a batch. And so the question becomes, are batch and streaming really all that different? I would argue that they're not. In practice, a batch is nothing more than a bounded stream, making batch processing a special case of streaming. And so this could lead us to a new definition of stream processing, one of uni unified online and offline analytics. And so in the case of building up these reports, you should not have to rewrite an application to run on a bounded versus unbounded stream. A SQL query that works on a CSV file or database or Parquet data lake should also just work on an unbounded Pulsar topic, providing the same semantics and results. One issue in practice when considering all data as a stream is how it's going to be stored. 
In many architectures, only the most recent data is available in log format, while historic data is stored in a data lake on a DFS. And so you need to think about how do I migrate data from one place to the other? How does my business logic bridge the gap between the two? I don't want to drop data or duplicate records. And that's why we really love technologies like Pulsar that provide a unified storage layer for historic and real-time data and allow us to just view our data as a stream. So we've expanded our worldview, uh, but let's push the boundaries a little bit. Consider machine learning. This is another domain where it's very easy to put most tasks into one of two very general categories. We have our offline model training and online model serving. Model training is a batch process, and we now understand that this is part of the streaming world. But what about model serving? When you put a model into production, what you want to do is continuously score records against that model and take action based on the results. And when you hear that word continuously, it should be setting off alarm bells in your head that this is a use case for streaming. Under the hood, from the point of view of a framework, continuously aggregating data for a report is not all that different from continuously scoring records. Think about it. The framework is taking a record, calling a user code function, and then doing something with the output. If the output is an aggregation, that's your real-time report. And if the output is a score, that's model serving. But it's all just the same thing. It's all just streaming. And so we can now start to see streaming is the intersection of data analytics and applications. You could also think of your stream as a sequence of requests going into a service with responses coming out of it again. This is how event sourcing architectures encourage you to think about things. If you have just a plain old web server and someone is making API calls, right, that is their request and your response is JSON or a web page or whatever it may be. Now in a true event sourcing architecture, we're going to probably not be using REST APIs but a log, uh, but conceptually it's still the same thing. It's all just a stream. And so that means that stream processing is to event-driven applications with the databases to request response apps. And when you start to see stream processing as a tool for processing records and managing state, context about the world, it begins to look a lot like an event-driven database. Many systems today use databases not for their powerful feature sets, not because they needed a relational database with foreign keys and transactions, but as glorified fault tolerance mechanisms. When you don't really need the capability of a relational database, they're just trying to ensure that you don't lose information in the case of downtime, it's a very heavy architecture with a lot of unnecessary complexity. So as streaming use cases evolve within an organization, many teams come to realize that streaming frameworks can provide a way to build stateful systems where fault tolerance is simply an implementation detail of the system. And this leads us to what I believe is the true definition of stream processing. It is a flexible and extensible architecture for data-driven applications. And under this definition, we have an incredibly broad set of use cases that stream processing can help you to solve. It's everything from very laggy or bounded streams, what we call batch processing for our data warehousing and BI uh, tools, to continuous ETL and real-time reporting, all the way to more event-driven systems, such as behavior modeling for recommendation systems or pricing, fraud detection, all the way to true distributed OLTP-style applications. And this is the set of use cases that Apache Flink is looking to solve. Flink is a stateful streaming framework that's looking to solve the full breadth of streaming use cases. So very quickly, before getting into the technical details, I want to talk a little bit about the project. As its name implies, Apache Flink is a top-level Apache project. And I'm happy to say we have a very vibrant, active, and diverse community. We are consistently ranked as one of being one of the most active projects in the Apache ecosystem, both in terms of commits and mailing list traffic. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved in the project, the user mailing list is a great place to start. So back to the good stuff, right? Uh, all of this sounds great, right? That definition makes sense. You can see why all those different use cases are technically encompassed by it but you still may be a little dubious in practice, right? What do these set of use cases really have in common on a technical level? And why can one framework claim to have strong support for all of them? Well, at the end of the day, I'm going to claim that Flink really just provides two core primitives out of the box. 
and that those two primitives are all you need to solve all of these problems. Everything else we talk about in terms of API is just details. So first of all, Flink is stateful. And this is important because even the most mundane systems require state. If you want to count to 10, you have to remember that you've already counted up to nine. State provides context about the world. It tells us where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And with Flink, you're always working with local states. You're writing the simple code you were doing back when you first learned how to program with thread local variables. At the same time, Flink is able to provide what we call exactly once state semantics. So this means that even in the case of failure, Flink is going to provide the same correct results as if no issue had ever occurred. The second primitive is single record at a time processing. Flink is going to process each record individually, which allows for incredible flexibility in what it can do. There are no arbitrary limitations, such as micro-batching imposed upon the system. And this is a framework that has been proven out at scale. So these numbers come from inside Alibaba on Singles Day, which is the largest online shopping day in the world. If you're not familiar, you can think of it as the Black Friday of China, but much, much larger than anything we see in the West. So everything inside Alibaba is powered by Flink. There are thousands of applications running on millions of containers, processing nearly an exabyte of data per day, while managing to do billions of events per second with sub-second latency. And most importantly, Flink is trusted to provide correct, reliable results. Alibaba is managing hundreds of terabytes of state inside Flink itself, and there are no external data stores used for fault tolerance. And these results uh, from these systems are quite literally taken to the bank. So last November on Singles Day, Alibaba did nearly $37 billion, billion with a B, uh, dollars in one day sales. And those financial transactions were all processed by Flink applications. But that's not to say you need to be at a very large scale to work with Flink. So this image is a Raspberry Pi that is running a full Flink application. Flink can be deployed on a single core and still provide all the benefits of consistent state at small scales. And so that's what Flink is. It is stateful, single record at a time processing. At the same time, and that, that all sounds good, but we acknowledge that as engineers working day to day, you're going to have very different needs depending where on the spectrum of use cases you're working. That's why Flink ships with a number of first class APIs. So at the core is the data stream API. If you've used Flink in the past, this is probably what you're most familiar with. It's a Java based API that gives you low level control over streams, state management, and time. For analytics use cases, there's Flink SQL and the table API. Flink SQL is unified over batch and streaming and anti-SQL compliance. This means it's the SQL you already know if you've ever used a database before. There's no new syntax or semantics to learn. And we support the full TPS DS query set, which is a way of saying we support a very large portion of the SQL standard. Most queries that you can come up with are going to work with Flink out of the box. But on the other end, for our true event-driven systems, we offer what we call the Stateful Functions API. And this is where I want to start. So Flink is used in production today for a large number of high-profile systems in the event-driven space. ING uses Flink to serve their fraud detection models to, prevent, to protect their banking customers. Flink uses, uh, excuse me, Lyft uses Flink to calculate their real-time pricing. And DriveTribe is actually an entire social network built on top of Flink in a CQRS event sourcing style. So as I said, Stateful Functions is the API that exposes Flink's two core primitives specifically for this set of use cases. Simply put, Stateful Functions is an API on top of the Flink runtime that simplifies building distributed Stateful applications. Users develop their applications by implementing several services, or what we call functions, which are basically small pieces of code or logic that represent entities within an application. You could, for example, define a function type representing a user with an individual instance of that function type for every user in your application. Function instances are invocable through messages and do not consume resources when not actively being invoked. This means that the runtime can have a theoretically infinite number of function instances within a fixed finite set of hardware resources. 
We encourage you to model your application as granularly as possible, so instead of being concerned with resource consumption. And we support implementing these functions in any language that supports HTTP, gRPC, or Unix sockets, which is to say we support virtually every language out of the box. And we can do all of this with dynamic messaging and consistent state. What this means is you do not have to predefine data flow DAGs. Any function can message any other in arbitrary, potentially round robin ways, or round trip ways. All a function needs to know in order to invoke another is what we call its function type and ID. So there's no service discovery required. It's very efficient. For example, if we want to message the function for a particular user, we could do so without ever knowing where that function is physically located or even what language it's implemented in. Most importantly, this can all be done with exactly one semantics. So our function instances can keep local state, while the runtime ensures that messaging and state updates are integrated, so users can have out-of-the-box efficient consistency. This holds across event inputs to the application, function state, messaging between functions, and outputs delivered from the application. And all this works with no database required. So when I discuss Flink providing strong fault tolerance guarantees previously, this is exactly what I was referring to. The strong consistency uh, semantics provided by stateful functions is realized on top of Flink's distributed state snapshotting model. So the runtime is going to take periodic consistent snapshots of all function instance states, as well as their corresponding positions and in input ingresses and transaction state of egresses. Uh, and those snapshots form a consistent distributed view of the application at a point in time that's periodically persisted to some distributed file system, such as Amazon S3, HDFS, and NFS drive, whatever you have available. And if you're not familiar with Flink already, uh, what this basically means is that function state and consistency and fault tolerance is not handled by a database or externally managed system, but instead the stream processor itself. And all you need is blob storage to store the periodic state snapshots. The final notable thing I'd like to mention about this API is how distributed stateful applications implemented using stateful functions can seamlessly take advantage of modern serverless platforms like AWS Lambda or Kubernetes deployments. This gives you the operational management benefits of these platforms like rapid scalability, scale to zero, and zero downtime upgrades. This is all possible due to some careful runtime design choices. As you can see in this diagram, a stateful functions application uses a Flink cluster for, manage, uh, for message routing and state management, uh, while allowing the actual functions containing application logic to be deployed on a separate compute tier. What this gives us is that the runtime is going to keep logical co-location of compute and state for consistency, while at the same time physically separating deployment of this compute tier. The physical compute layer can be operated as a stateless service because all state accesses and updates are integrated as part of function invocation requests and responses. So I want to look at a real example of something that we've built out using this API. Uh, and we, I want to look specifically at model serving. So uh, we're a financial entity and we want to detect fraud in our financial transactions. We need a feature store to keep track of all of our different data points. We can build up feature vectors, and we need models that we can score against. The interaction of these two services is roughly we have this feature function that tracks these data points about users. And when it gets a message for a transaction saying, score this, please, it's going to, these functions are going to message each other dynamically, building up feature vectors containing all relevant data points before messaging the model function to score that vector against the model, and then take some action based on the result, such as notify the user, hey, we think we've detected fraud, or potentially even block the transaction from completing. The model function might contain different configurations for every user within our system. Some people may have a higher tolerance for fraudulent activity, and so they want to be more vigilant. In this scenario, feature and configuration bookkeeping have to be accurate. You don't want to score based on incorrect data or outdated configurations. And so we need consistent messaging and state between these services. Another aspect of the scenario is that services could be implemented by different teams, each with their own language preference. So the feature function might be implemented by a platform team that likes to use Java, keeping track of our data points. 
But the model service is certainly going to be implemented by our data science team in Python. And these teams can work independently and bundle their own, what we call modules or bundles of functions that can be packaged together as a single consistent application. But then we have the other end of the spectrum, right? Streaming analytics. This is most people's initial uh, introduction to streaming. And as I said, for that, we offer the SQL and table APIs, different ways of exposing Flink's core runtime primitives for this set of use cases. And I want to talk a little bit about what it means to run a SQL query on top of an infinite stream, right? What does it mean to run a SQL query on top of an infinitely large table? Well, to do that, let's first think about what it means to run a SQL query traditionally on a bounded table, a table in a traditional database. So we have this data, and let's say these are clicks coming in from our website. This row says Mary clicked on a specific link at 12. Rows are inserted as they arrive, and at some point we decide we want to learn something. I want to know how many URLs each user has clicked on. And so we're going to call up the data science team. They're going to go hard at work. And they're going to come back with something like this. And so we'll submit this query to the database. And if you, what this does is effectively take a snapshot of the input data when the query begins processing. It's just a fancy way of saying that if a new row is added to the database while the query is running, it is not going to be considered in the result set. This is the semantics you're already familiar with. We're just trying to formalize it. So the query is going to run, it's going to read that data, partition it, aggregate it, transform it, do all those good things that the runtime needs to do before outputting some final results. It tells us Mary clicked on two links, Bob clicked on one. And of course, because we run, ran on a bounded input set, the query is going to finish running. We may iterate on this query a few times until we get it right, but eventually we settle on something that we really like. And so when we want to deploy this to production, right? Think analytics in production. Well, that's just stream processing. Because now what I want to do is start with my query. I know the business logic I need to run, but I want to continuously ingest data and dynamically update my report. So now every time a record is written to this table, think every time there is a new record uh, made available inside Pulsar, we are going to immediately ingest it. Uh, the runtime is going to maintain some internal state. It's going to uh, incrementally update some things and then output a result. So I see that Mary's clicked on one link. Bob has also clicked on one. And at some point, we may issue an update. Hey, I told you Mary clicked on one link. Turns out it was two. What's really key here is that at this point in time where we have processed the exact same data as our bounded query, we are outputting identical results. It is the same syntax and semantics. There is nothing on the screen that you have not seen before if you've already worked with a database. The only difference now is that we're going to keep on processing. And so as this fourth row is inserted, we're going to continue to update our reports. Now, I said we're anti-SQL compliant. And that's really key because it means there's no new syntax you have to learn. There's no new features that you're unfamiliar with. That said, when working in a streaming context, there are certain features uh, available in the SQL standard that become more interesting. So let's say we have this data set, right? We're going to keep on with our clicks. And I am on a data engineering team that likes to follow some best practices. And so we've normalized our data, right? Coming from the website, all I know is the user, the time, and the article that they were reading. Uh, but we have additional metadata internally. You could think this is a star, of this as a star schema. My log is the dimension is the fact table, and I have these dimension tables uh, that provide some additional context, such as the subscription status of my users. To perform my query, I need to join these together. The tricky part is because this is streaming and continuous. I don't want to join a particular user and get their current subscription status. But instead, I want to know what their status was at the point in time at which they performed the click. So when Mary clicked on her first article, she was a free user. So was Bob. But when Mary clicked on her second article, she had changed her subscription status to paid. We enable this through something called a temporal table join 
that gives you the access to the history of a dynamic table. You can think we are joining with our dimension table as it looked at a particular point in time. And so we can very easily uh, denormalize star schemas in a dynamic way. And we're going to take the results of this query and store it as a view because we're going to do some further processing. So we could aggregate and create a report, uh, but I want to do something else. I want to show you what I think is my absolute favorite feature inside of Flink, and that is pattern matching. So our ask is to detect conversions resulting from one or more, from a user clicking on one or more free articles uh, before subscribing. And to do that, we offer this feature called Match Recognize that has been available as part of the ANSI SQL standard since 2016. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, it's only available in Oracle and Apache Flink. So this is what that query looks like, and we're going to break it down. First thing we're going to do is read from our view. So take a consume from these joined click data with uh, subscription metadata. We'll now go into the match recognize clause. We're going to partition this data by user ID and order it by time. So this partition by is just like a group by, right? I want to detect this pattern for each user individually. And we want to ensure that we process these records in the correct order. Let's now jump down to our pattern. And if you've ever worked with a regular expression in the past, I suspect this looks very familiar. We're saying if we see one or more free events followed immediately by a paid event, then that is going to be a match. And I set a time constraint of one day, but that is completely optional. And we're defining these events as such. A free event is any row, any record, where the subscription is equal to free. And a paid event is any record where the subscription is not free. And so when we see that pattern, we're going to measure it. This is like our select uh, statement. And so how am I going to measure it? Well, I'm going to count the number of free articles this person read before subscribing. And if we processed our data, we would get an output of Mary and one because she read one free article before subscribing. And so taking all of this together, I want to show how we can very practically use Flink and Pulsar to solve a real business problem. So let's say that we're a business that sells products to customers. Uh, I know it's revolutionary, but we're going to give it a shot. And uh, we have lots of different data sets, some that are very fast moving and some that are slow. So our fast moving data is going to live inside a Pulsar. This is where we're keeping track of our orders and our line items. Every time someone uh, buys something, we're going to have a record and add it to that Pulsar. Uh, but we also have some slow changing data, right? There are the regions and nations in which we operate. This information rarely, if ever, changes. And it still makes sense to store in a relational database like MySQL. Our product ask is to generate a real-time dashboard that our sales team, a non-technical entity within our business, can look at and to have up-to-the-moment insights into how the business is performing within the different regions in which we operate. And you can see that even though this data is spread across multiple systems, there are still relationships amongst them. Orders and customers are stored in different places, uh, but there's still a foreign key relationship there, and I should be able to join them together. And so we're going to take a look at the Flink SQL client. This gives you a very convenient way to quickly iterate and build Flink SQL applications. So let's give this a shot. Uh, I'm in here, and I have pre-created some tables. We're going to take a look. So we have these tables that are uh, data in Pulsar, and I have a data generator that is continuously writing new records. Uh, we have access to the typical things you need in a data space, such as a Hive catalog. And in there, I am storing my uh, MySQL tables. So we have access to both. First thing I'm going to do, because I don't quite know what my query is yet, is change my execution type to batch. So I'm telling Flink, hey, we're going to be doing some iterative processing. And we are only want to work with bounded data sets. Uh, when, because batch is a special case of streaming, when we know we're in a batch context, Flink is able to provide some extra optimizations and our queries can be a little more efficient. So I'm now going to go ahead and write a SQL query. And 
we're doing a lot of things here. There is a subquery, there's multiple joins, group buys, aggregations, all the non-trivial but common tasks that you are going to be doing day to day when uh, writing analytics. And so I'll go ahead and submit this to the SQL client. And it's very quickly going to come back with some results telling me uh, what my query says. So we can page through this and we can look and I can uh, maybe zoom in on a particular row to get some extra insight. And we may iterate on our query a few times, but eventually we decide this is it. This provides the context that I need, the insights that I'm interested in. So let's deploy to production. I am going to set my execution type back to streaming. Let's run this job continuously, uh, reading new data from Pulsar as it arrives. And when you're doing uh, streaming SQL, you can think of Flink as being like a materialized view engine, constantly generating new data, updating our report. Uh, but we still need a place to store it. And so I'm going to create a table inside of my SQL to write our results, the post aggregation, post joined results. So we'll create this table. And then we are also now going to submit our query. You'll see here that I have changed nothing. This is the exact same select statement we were previously running. Uh, the only difference being that we are inserting the results into MySQL, into that table we just created. So we'll go ahead and run that. And now Flink is going to continuously read records from Pulsar, join it with data in MySQL, aggregate it, and write the results out. And I've put together this little Grafana dashboard that is continuously reading from that table and visualizing the results. But in Grafana, I'm not doing anything. It is truly just running a select star statement over and over. This is something we can do cheaply and repeatedly uh, to power our visualization. And because we're using Flink, we are getting scalability and fault tolerance out of the box. That query is production ready. And so we have a very fast path from initial analytic development to production deployment. And so that is a whirlwind tour of Flink, right? Where everything from event-driven applications to real-time reporting to batch processing. Uh, and when we leverage it with a tool like Pulsar, we can have a great way of solving so many production business concerns. So thank you all so much for having me. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any time for questions, but I'm looking forward to another great day of talks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, we actually are just up on time. I know a couple questions came through. So Seth, where can they, where can people follow up with you? Yes. Uh, so uh, I have it on the first page of my slides. Uh, I am at SJ Wiesman on basically every platform. So uh, Twitter, GitHub, SJ Wiesman at Apache. Uh, I'm also Seth at Ververica. So uh, feel free to shoot me an email there as well. Great. Definitely appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.